We're going to talk about end-stage osteoarthritis, not isolated cartilage lesions, which is a whole different topic. This is about end-stage osteoarthritis in young athletic people. They're too young for total joint replacements, but they still want to remain active. Um, we're going to cover hip, shoulder, knee, elbow, and ankle. So once uh, the first line of defense in arthritis is activity modification, uh, weight loss, therapy, and bracing. But what do you do if these don't work? Well, the, we've all had these patients come in, they say, Doc, it still hurts, I'm getting old, and I have to run, play tennis, do Zumba, whatever keeps them going and that, what they live for to do and have fun, they can't do it and it's very frustrating. And uh, some just want to throw the ball with their kids and they can't due to uh, arthritis in the shoulder or knee. So we'll talk about knee osteoarthritis first. Uh, osteoarthritis in the knee can come from ligament injury or post-traumatic or even genetic factors. Uh, you have the issue of knee abusers, which are these people that have had two, three, four ACL tears. They keep coming back. They keep wanting to ski and wakeboard and, and snowboard and all this stuff. And they keep injuring their knee over and over again. And uh, the, uh, the, we call these knee abusers. No matter what you do surgically to their knee, it, it's not going to hold up. And they, and they don't want to slow down. Um, Part of the process of arthritis is cartilage damage, meniscus tearing. Uh, you start to get flexion contractures and, lo and loss of full flexion. Um, you develop effusions. And the important thing to know it from your patient is asking them whether they have mechanical symptoms like locking, catching, popping, or whether it's a constant ache. Constant ache is more of an uh, arthritic condition. Um, the uh, lock and catching popping can be solved with sometimes arthroscopy. So uh, in the knee you have the medial and patellofemoral compartments are the most commonly affected. So medial compartment arthritis here, uh, more mild medial compartment arthritis, and this is patellofemoral arthritis. First line uh, of defense, uh, once you start, once you finish with conservative measures, is visco supplementation. So, uh, Synvisc, Orthovisc are the different kind of uh, uh, injections that you can perform. Uh, these have some good results, but uh, I can tell you it doesn't work on everybody, and it's very expensive. Next uh, line of defense is arthroscopic debridement. So it's basically cl cleaning up the joint. You address the loose pieces, the loose bodies floating, the synovitis. Uh, and this can help mechanical symptoms, um, but if effusions continue and they st continue to complain of pain even after uh, knee arthroscopy, uh, then you have to start discussing arthroplasty options with your patient. One, one uh, um, step before arthroplasty, though, is, a, is what's called an osteotomy which is uh, changing the alignment of the bone. So normally the weight-bearing alignment is through the medial compartment, but if you can change the, medial, change the alignment of the knee from slightly uh, bow-legged to slightly knock-kneed, you change the, uh, the weight-bearing axis to in the lateral compartment, and this can help unload the arthritic compartment and buy them five, six, seven years. And that's the goal, but the problem with osteotomies is that it makes the eventual total knee replacement more difficult because you have this plate involved and it changes uh, the alignment and the length of your patella tendon. So it makes it more likely that you'll rip your patella tendon during a total knee arthroplasty, which is a devastating problem. So this is what we're trying to avoid is the total knee arthroplasty. You can see complete uh, coverage of the distal femur and the proximal tibia. You can see cement in the uh, tibia and then in this empty space, there's a polyethylene spacer. And this, so that's what a total knee replacement looks like. This will last anywhere between uh, 5 to 20 years, sometimes a little more. Um, but there is a life uh, span, a limited lifespan. So if you can't put this in 30-year-olds, although it happens very rarely and in specific instances. You want to try to get patients to 60 years old or so before you, you do this. Uh, one because uh, the implant will only last so many years, and two, the younger they are, the more active they are, and the more they'll wear their joint out. So then we have uh, partial replacement options. So one is called the uh, unicompartmental replacement, and the other is called resurfacing. So if you look on this side, this is a unicompartmental replacement. Um, it's basically a half of a total uh, knee replacement. Here's the AP, and here's the lateral view. 
you, you could see a bone saw is used to shave off the top of the tibia and then this piece is cemented in and this piece is also cemented on the femur versus the resurfacing which you do not use a bone saw it preserves more bone stock on the tibia and on the femur and it's held in by a screw so there's no cement on the femur and there's some cement in the tibia but the benefit of the resurfacing is it preserves bone stock and when you come in to do the total knee replacement you can use uh, you can cut your bone at your regular position that you're used to doing and you could just take this piece of metal out and then you're not uh, having to put in any complicated revision type total knee replacement equipment so the benefits uh, of the resurfacing are you don't have to use a bone saw it, it maintains a more normal anatomy, and this could increase the length of survival of the implant. Now for patellofemoral arthritis, it's associated with patellofemoral instability, and a lot of these patients have had previous procedures such as tibial tubercle osteotomies or medial patellofemoral ligament reconstructions. But you can see on this patient here, there's a patient had a history of a tibial tubercle osteotomy. So um, this makes eventually the total knee replacement that they'll have uh, much more difficult. So what you're trying to do for these patients is buy them time and avoid that total knee replacement as long as possible. But these patients can be surprisingly young. I've done uh, resurfacings in these patients as young as 32 years old. This is what the patellofemoral resurfacing looks like. Uh, the metal uh, plate covers the distal femur, the trochlea area, and there's a plastic button on the patella. Uh, again, this is uh, surprisingly, it is performed in surprisingly young patients um, that, uh, that get this uh, grade 4 osteoarthritis on their patella from multiple dislocations or uh, just severe patellofemoral syndrome and chondromalacia. I've uh, had people return to athletic activity as early as 7 to 8 weeks, basically as soon as the medial retinaculum heels where you have to make your incision to flip the patella over to get access to it. As soon as that incision heals, they can return to activity. So now we're going to discuss the hip. Um, hip arthritis occurs in, in younger people than, uh, than the knee and shoulder. Um, and it's recently been attributed to what's called femoroacetabular impingement. So it's too, too much bone on the cup, which is called a pincer lesion or too much bone on the femur, which is called a cam lesion, or both. So basically, these, these extra bony areas hit each other, and they squeeze the labrum in between and tear the labrum. And then the, once the labrum tears, it uh, uncovers the underlying cartilage, and then the cartilage starts to peel up, almost like if you're changing carpet in your house, and you pull it up off the, uh, the cement underneath. That's exactly what starts happening with the cartilage. It actually just peels right up off the bone um, and uh, there's no sticking the cartilage back. Once it starts to peel up, it's, uh, it's kind of a downward spiral after that. So hip arthritis begins earlier than others, and it's due mainly to femoroacetabular impingement. So this is a 16-year-old athlete, believe it or not, and you can see how shredded the hip is. This is the labrum, and this is how torn the cartilage is, the, the labrum and also the cartilage. There's cartilage flaps. And right underneath there is grade four osteoarthritis. So 16-year-old child, I mean, this is a, it's very um, uh, unsatisfying to see kids have this. And I'll show you that again, because it's so uh, impressive. So again, the femoral head down here, the acetabular rim up here, and the shredded uh, cartilage and labrum. So one of the options to treat this uh, player or kid would be to just shave out the labrum, and that's been shown in research not to be the optimal way to do it. It, it helps in the, long, in the short term. It helps the pain, but it uh, uncovers the cartilage even more, and more of the cartilage will peel off, and they, they have a downward spiral. The uh, cartilage peels off more and more until they develop not only arthritis on the cup, but the friction between the cup and the normal ball then wears off the cartilage on the ball, and then you're dealing with grade four osteoarthritis by the time they're in their late 20s. And then they're looking for uh, total hip replacements in their late 20s and 30s.
So what we do to, to help these uh, kids is we go in and we repair arthroscopically the labrum. And uh, we do that with uh, anchors and suture. And we try to uh, get rid of the loose pieces of cartilage and uh, stabilize the labrum so that it protects the remaining cartilage. And then we'll microfracture the subchondral bone to try to get it to regenerate some cartilage. So uh, we're now doing 200 to 250 of these surgeries a year. And we're getting kids from all over the state and beyond uh, that, uh, for whatever reason, have been told they, uh, some of them get sent to a psychiatrist. Like, nobody can figure out what's wrong. Sometimes they'll get MRIs that don't show anything because they're not getting MRIs with dye. So they're mi people are missing the tears and they're not used to seeing them. And uh, they're called a hip, uh, you know, a hip pointer, a groin pull, a strained groin. But what's really going on is their hips are shredded in, in on the inside and it's gonna get worse and worse until it uh, gets, um, the bony architecture gets addressed. And that's the other point is you can't just fix the labrum. Well, you can, it just won't help them in the long term because if you leave the bone unaddressed, the same mechanism that tore the labrum in the first place is going to continue. The impingement will continue and then they'll tear their labrum again. The repair you did will, will tear again and then they'll develop more and more arthritis. The next option for uh, after arthroscopy is uh, re resurfacing of the hip. And resurfacing of the hip for a while was extremely popular. It was also called the Birmingham hip was one of the, um, one of the uh, hip uh, models that was out there that was getting put in. Um, it was kind of touted as the perfect hip surgery for young athletes. It got people back to doing what they wanted to do. But just, I wanna, I'm going to explain why, but just remember, there's no perfect surgery. There's always a downside to every surgery. So metal, uh, Birmingham hips are metal on metal, and uh, all hip arthroplasties, the basically different options are metal on plastic, ceramic on plastic, uh, or metal on metal. They all shed particles, especially the particles of the softer material. So a, me a metal on plastic, which is the most common um, hip replacement, sheds plastic particles. Well, plastic particles are benign. You can have, pla we know this, plastic particles in your hip, uh, some t in some people they form cysts, but there's no incidence of cancer or other problems with plastic particles. Your body doesn't absorb them. But with metal on metal, there's uh, no softer material, so it, it sheds metal ions from both sides. It also sheds more material because the head is bigger, so there's more uh, circumference and more material in contact that's uh, shedding more uh, metal ions. So uh, basically cobalt chrome and titanium are the different metals that are used, and that's made up of uh, nickel, cobalt, zinc, copper, iron. And what they're finding uh, with blood draws and uh, biopsies of livers and kidneys, they're finding levels of metal ions in all these organs. Well, does that matter? Um, well, nobody really knows. That's the, that's the thing. And they haven't been studying this stuff for long enough to know whether it's going to cause a big problem or not. So uh, it's really started to fall out of favor, the metal on metal hips. And people are going back now to the, uh, in the resurface things, people are going back now to the traditional total hips, metal on plastic, because, you know, the first rule of medicine is do no harm. So if you make their hip feel better and they, get, they can go play tennis, but they're shedding ions and they're going to get uh, some problem later because of all these metal ions in their body, you really didn't help the patient out. Um, so uh, the, the basic... Uh, Rule is be care, be, beware of perfect. There's no perfect surgery for anybody. Another option in hip arthritis is for the young patient is called the periacetabular osteotomy. This is a very big surgery. Um, the only person uh, in this area that does them is Dr. Axelrad, but uh, it's, a, it's a large incision. You uh, break the bone, you break the acetabulum, and you actually twist the bone and then uh, refix it with screws. Um, and this is, a, uh, an, again, a big surgery, long recovery, and uh, it's, I, would, I would think I would much rather have an arthroscopic procedure if I could uh, rather than this because it's such a large surgery. So the bottom line with hip arthritis is diagnose it as early as possible, restore more normal bony anatomy, uh, repair the labrum whenever possible instead of debriding. Now for the shoulder. Uh, the shoulder, shoulder osteoarthritis is less common than the hip and the knee, 
Uh, it begins in usually older people the, in 40s or 50s, and it happens in people that have previous surgeries. So in this particular patient, if you've ever heard of a Laterge procedure, a bony block procedure for shoulder instability, that's what this is. They move the coracoid bone over to the front of the glenoid to keep the ball from sliding out. But the downside, again, sounds like a perfect surgery, keep the ball from sliding out, it works great. But 20 years later, they develop bone-on-bone arthritis because that extra bone was in the way there. So that's what this patient has, is uh, no cartilage surface left, and it's bone-on-bone. So the thing about shoulder uh, arthritis is visco supplementation is not covered by insurance. So I do have some patients that pay cash for visco supplementation, such as Synvisc, but it's thousand dollars an injection. So not many people can afford that. Um, arthroscopic debridement does have a role in the shoulder, and when you uh, do that, you basically remove the osteophytes. It's also called the goat's beard osteophyte. You can see it right here. It hangs down below the humeral head. Uh, it's a little tricky to do. You need to be specially trained to do it because uh, the axillary nerve is in the way and you can damage the axillary nerve. Again, first do no harm because if you axil- damage the axillary nerve, then uh, you kind of make the total uh, shoulder replacement that they'll, they'll eventually get uh, not work as well, if at all. So you don't want to um, you know, box the patient out of being able to have the definitive surgery that they'll need later in life. So um, people have been trying to find the right solution for young people with arthritis for a long time. So uh, people come up with different ideas. So here's a, a, a study with a hemiarthroplasty and then a bioresurfacing on the glenoid. So basically taking Achilles allograft, placing it on the glenoid, anchoring it down, and then putting a metal cap on the humerus. And uh, this is the Harvard group. Uh, out of Boston, and basically they uh, did 13 of these, and then at the end of their study they said it is not a reliable method uh, for treating osteoarthritis because people less than 50 years old are too active and they'll wear out anything that you put in their shoulder. So for total shoulders, the first one in the world was done in about 1893, uh, and not till the 1950s was one done in the United States. And it, it grew pretty fast. Started at about 10,000 in uh, 1990, and now it's up to about 60,000 annually. Here's a graph. Red is hemiarthroplasty, meaning half the joint was replaced, just the humeral head. Blue is a total arthroplasty, meaning the, the, shul- the uh, humerus and the glenoid. And you can see um, in about 2004, it took off. Well, guess what happened in 2004? The reverse shoulder was approved in the United States. So that's why, at that point, it took off because a lot of surgeons started using the reverse shoulder. Uh, Still, no matter how popular, prevalent the shoulder arthroplasty becomes, it's still much less than total knees and total hips. So you're looking at 60,000 a year versus total knees and total hips at almost a million. Here's a regional variation for shoulder arthroplasties, knee arthroplasties, and hip arthroplasty. And it's uh, amazing how much variety there is regionally and, and uh, for procedure and for location or geography. Um, but you can see us in southwest Louisiana, we're a hot spot for shoulder arthroplasty. And this was done before uh, I moved here, so it was already um, being done prevalently, but less so for the hips and knees. Um, totals ha- total arthroplasties have been going, being put in more commonly than hemiarthroplasty since 2006, not only because of the reverse shoulder, but also because several studies were being published that showed better results with total shoulder arthroplasty than hemiarthroplasty. Again, the total shoulder arthroplasty is here, metal ball, plastic cup. Over here, it's just the metal ball. That's the hemi. This is the total. So uh, total arthroplasty versus hemi. Total shoulders have better pain relief, better motion, and higher patient satisfaction. So that's why more are being put in. Um, There's about a 10% revision rate for hemi arthroplasty being converted to totals because the glenoid wears down and then you have instead of bone on bone arthritis, now you have metal on bone arthritis because the glenoid cartilage wears down because again, the, uh, any arthroplasty sheds the softer material. So if you have a hemiarthroplasty and you have a metal ball and, a, and cartilage on the, on the glenoid, what's going to lose? The cartilage is going to lose. It's the softer material. So you will shed cartilage particles until there's no more cartilage. 
Long-term follow-up of total shoulder arthroplasty, survival at five years is 94%, 10 years, 90%. Uh, 20 years, 81%. So you can see how it falls off. So that's why you don't want to go, the, the downside of putting in a total shoulder in a 50 year old is by the time they're 70, only about 20% of, uh, about 20% will need to be revised. Um, the higher, and it goes higher even for male gender and for patients with rotator cuff disease. And that's because males are uh, harder on their shoulders and the rotator cuff disease is because they get hum humeral escape because the rotator cuff tears and the, the, they basically get a rotator cuff arthropathy. So this is a, a study done on hemiarthroplasty and total shoulder arthroplasty put in for people less than 50 years old. So it's pretty, uh, pretty um, unsatisfying results here. Unsatisfying for the patient, 60% for hemis and 50% for totals. So that's for patients under 50. Now, you put a total shoulder in a 65-year-old, they're gonna be very happy. It's a very satisfying surgery. But the difference is these are less than 50-year-old patients. So your 45-year-old patient is not gonna be happy with a hemi or a total at least 50% of the time. That's very important um, to understand. Um, so the people that did this study actually said uh, basically think of alternative methods of treatment rather than using a traditional hemiarthroplasty or total shoulder arthroplasty in patients less than 50. Well, what's the alternative? We just talked about arthroscopy. That doesn't really work. Visco supplementation isn't uh, covered. So what they're saying is we really don't have an answer. The biggest problem with total shoulder arthroplasty is the glenoid. The humeral side works fine, it's the glenoid, because the glenoid gets loose. Why does it get loose? Well, the humeral head is not round, it's actually egg-shaped, but the prostheses are round. So you put the metal prosthesis in, it, it changes the biomechanics of the shoulder, and it actually causes a, what's called a rocking horse phenomenon on the glenoid, meaning when you internally rotate, it loads in the front. When you externally rotate, it loads in the back. And that micro motion over thousands of cycles will eventually loosen the glenoid and cause pain, and the glenoid will fail. This is why the main reason against putting in total shoulder replacements in young people. The other problem is periprosthetic fracture. <clears throat> so if you are a young person and you want to go skiing with bad shoulder arthritis and you get a total shoulder replacement and you go skiing and you fall, this is this is a devastating problem here. Um, not, not, a, not a lot of great solutions. Uh, one, of, one of the solutions is to put in a reverse shoulder with a fracture stem, but the problem with the reverse shoulders is they are really designed just to allow you to feed yourself and to you know, touch your, your face and your head. They're not designed for athletics at all. Reverse, people with reverse shoulders should not be doing almost any kind of athletics because the failure rate is 60 to 70% with reverse shoulders. So the reverse shoulder was first designed in Europe, and the complication rate is 60% uh, for uh, reverse shoulders in the European uh, literature. Reverse, again, is not for athletic activity. So what do we do with the young active patient with arthritis? Well, it's about recreating the normal anatomy and avoiding complications. Here, uh, this is the trend lately in total shoulder replacements is shorter and shorter stems. So here's a standard stem, 110 to 200 millimeters, uh, a little bit shorter, uh, 60s to 70 millimeters. And then here is the, the latest uh, type of total shoulder that's being done. And it's basically just a metal screw and a cap. So that's about as short as you can get. And the benefit here is down here, this will fracture at the tip of the, of the stem where there's a stress riser, but here there's no stress riser, and even if somehow you did fracture, uh, you could just treat that with, take this off and put a regular total shoulder um, in. So you, you have a bailout. It's always important with surgeries on young people to have a bailout to go to when what, you're what you just did to them doesn't work. So um, resurface resurfacings have been done for a long time. Uh, again, um, humerus survival, the humeral component, the, the, the ball, 96% survival. The downside is the glenoid. Again, for total shoulders and for resurfacings, the downside is the failure of the glenoid. And why is that? Again, the rocking horse phenomenon, you're putting a round 
humeral head in where an egg-shaped humeral head belongs. The other thing uh, with total shoulders or shoulder uh, arthroplasties is malpositioning. 30% of unsatisfactory total shoulders are due to malpositioning. There's a lot of variability in how you put that ball in. You can turn it, raise it, lower it, so you can actually change the anatomy of the patient. The important thing is to recreate the anatomy, and that's the theory with how you would increase longevity of these implants is recreating the normal anatomy. So again, the humeral head has a 96% survival rate. That's really not where the problem is. The problem is the glenoid failing. But is the glenoid failing because the humeral head you're putting in is not anatomic? It's basically putting a perfect sphere in when the humeral head natively is not actually a per perfect sphere. It's more egg-shaped. So that's the rationale behind the arthrosurface system <clears throat> is it recreates a normal anatomy. Normal anatomy of the humeral head is an egg. So here's the humeral head. You can see how it's uh, longer top to bottom than it is side to side. There's the biceps tendon. So here's a study of this new implant that's being uh, used and basically shows that the center of rotation for the normal humeral head is here. The center of rotation for the arthrosurface anatomic implant is here and the regular hemiarthroplasty is here. So what we're doing is trying to recreate the normal anatomy and normal center of rotation. So again, the humeral head side has a good track record, but the goal now is to match anatomy. The glenoid is the weak link, and is uh, recreating the normal anatomy, is that going to increase the lifespan of the glenoid? Well, the other option is to improve the glenoid. So we know that the on-leg glenoid, or the traditional glenoid, has a, a pretty high failure rate. That's the weak link. Well, what about inlaying the glenoid so that the load is shared, uh, as in this picture? And that's also uh, a, new, uh, a new design, is that actually the glenoid implant sits within the glenoid bone. And it's held in with just a little bit of cement. Instead of sitting up top, like the traditional glenoid implant. This is load sharing and sits flush with the glenoid surface. This is what it looks like during, during surgery. This is the view of the glenoid you can get. The humerus, humeral head is pushed down by this retractor, so it's externally rotated and down, and you're looking right at the, the uh, glenoid. This is anterior, this is posterior, and this is what the implant looks it covers about 80% of the glenoid surface, and I usually leave the labrum intact if I can. So we implant the, uh, the glenoid, then we implant the humeral head, and then this is what the, uh, the new total shoulder resurfacing implant looks like. So I want to uh, this is a case report. A 50-year-old laborer, uh, total sh uh, he needs a total shoulder. He failed conservative measures. Uh, he has this goat's beard deformity here, bone-on-bone -bone arthritis. There's no joint space left. Rotator cuff is intact. If uh, rotator, cu rotator cuff is not intact, you cannot do a, shoulder or a total shoulder arthroplasty. Here's the MRI showing the rotator cuff intact. Here's the subchondral cysts, goat's beard deformity down here with the bone spur, posterior bone spur, biceps tendon, deltoid muscle. This is what uh, the arthrosurface implant looks like. The, uh, the cup is here, the glenoid implant is here, inlaid. Here's the uh, arthrosurface implant on the humerus. And this is the patient, he had bilateral. <coughs> this is uh, 12 weeks on his left and six weeks on his right. He's the boss. He's not technically an athlete unless beer drinking is considered athletic, but he, he is an active laborer and was very happy to get back to work instead of three, four months. He's back to work at, uh, at uh, you know, 10, 12 weeks after, you know, after each shoulder. Here's a traumatic osteoarthritis from a gunshot wound of the shoulder in a 28-year-old. So you can see the bullet slug up here. So that bullet slug trashed her entire joint. So we put, this, uh, we put the implant in, the anatomically correct implant, and hopefully uh, she's going to test the longevity of this thing. I mean, hopefully this will last for her for 30, 40 years. But the odds are against it, but we'll see what happens. But there was really no other option for her. 
Now here's a, a patient with uh, bone-on-bone arthritis, but she had a proximal humerus fracture when she was younger and it healed as a malunion. Well, you can't put a total, regular total shoulder uh, in, her, in her humerus because of the stem. The stem would hit the callus and you wouldn't be able to drive the stem down. So uh, she, and, and look at this big osteophyte here, but there's not enough room for traditional uh, shoulder replacement stem. So you put the, uh, the smaller, the, the resurfacing without a stem and then you bypass that problem. Uh, now we'll move on to the elbow and ankle arthritis and uh, just a few words on that. Basically, uh, elbow arthritis happens in post-traumatic patients, uh, genetic and rheumatoid issues. Uh, the options for elbow arthritis are conservative measures, injection, therapy. But uh, arth uh, arthroscopy is helpful in the elbow. You can do synovectomies and loose body removals, but there's no arthroplasty option really for elbow arthritis. Same thing with ankle. There's really no arthroplasty option that allow a young patient to get back to athletics. There, there are arthroplasty options, but not proven to allow a young person to get back to athletics. Um, but uh, again, the ankle, just like the elbow, is amenable to arthroscopy with debridement, synovectomy, loose body removals, and, um, and uh, lysis of adhesions to allow them to get full motion again. And that's it.